So guys, this is it. The review of the glorious 407 Coupe. This is going to be your only go-to guide from a Peugeot lover, a slight Peugeot expert that's going to tell you everything in and out of this car and why you should buy one in 2023, 4, 5 and all the other years coming. So this car as you can see, I mean just on the road it has presence. This car is not for the faint-hearted. First of all, it is almost 5 metres long. Not exaggerating, it is one hell of a long car. Just be aware when you buy one of these, it's not the smallest. Now, in terms of looks as a coupe, I think it's quite beautiful. So you're soon going to see the rear quarter view is amazing. The front is a little bit interesting. Like I said, it's 50-50 to people whether they really like the look of this car or not. But who cares? You're buying one. So if you love it, it doesn't really matter. So obviously being a front-wheel drive coupe, it has quite a large front overhang and quite a stout rear view. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about daily drivability, we're going to talk about the features of the car, and then we'll get on to other things throughout the um, review of the car as well. So in terms of daily drivability, it's quite big. Now, all of these come with rear parking sensors standard. If you get yourself a GT or you've got a well-spec SE, you will have front parking sensors. It does make the world because of the front, uh, front overhang here. As you can see also, this one is featuring the spec option of 19s. Now, the 407 Coupe only came with one rim choice, which is a little bit disappointing. So I put a little photo on here now over the car. They are 18 inch rims, five spokes. They are the standard fit. You'll see them on pretty much every Coupe. So if you do see one of these Coupes with these 19s, make sure you get it as long as the car's good, obviously, because they just look the part and they are excellent. Just one word of advice with the 19s, so make sure when you go to look and buy the vehicle that you check that the rims aren't cracked or haven't had repairs done to them because these are quite prone for cracking. The problem is when they do crack, if you can't repair them, you can't buy another set because they're literally impossible to find. So just be aware of that. Just a little perk, we're gonna get more of these as we go through. The side profile of the car, as you can see, it's still really, really, really long. It's a big old car. The side profile is, Lovely. I think it's a really, really nice shape. Now, this is helped by the fact that this car is running spacers and is lowered from the factory height. Um, so just be aware that obviously if you buy a coupe, it will be higher than this. Um, this is lowered. Um, but as a daily car, in terms of ride height and drivability, you're not gonna have any issues. Um, they tend to probably sit, I would say, you know, that much more higher than there. So normal driving, you're not gonna have any issues with driving it through fields or you know, um, down grassy lanes or any issues with bumps um, and fouling of suspension with things like that. Now, if you do get the V6 engines, the engines do sit very low in these cars, so they do have quite a low center underneath, but on the standard ride height, it'll be okay for every sort of daily use. I do find with the lowered one, it can be a bit of a problem sometimes with dirt tracks um, and lanes. But as you can see, it's very striking. Now also, depending on how you are, if you struggle with mobility, there is one potential problem. Might be me just being silly, but these doors are very heavy. And I'm not exaggerating, generally, these are really heavy. Kirsten behind the camera, these doors are heavy, aren't they? Yeah. So if you catch this door on a hill or on a slope, and you haven't got the strength or the mobility, you will generally struggle. These are double skin doors. They're also packed with larger speakers um, and lots of inbuilt tech, leather, and metal inside of these. They do make one very heavy door. So just be aware of that. Some of these points are a little bit silly through the video, but I just want to literally be as honest as possible about ownership of the car. So we come around to the rear end. So all of the 407 coupes will feature rear parking sensors. So this one only has rear parking sensors as the Sport Auto Spec has. Um, and it's just helpful to know that you can reverse it in at least one way and you have got that feedback because the rear end, um, without the spoiler, you can't see nothing. And the front end, which I'll show you with a camera in a bit, you still can't see nothing on that front end. It's such a slope down, you cannot see nothing. So in terms of driving it, it can be quite difficult. Now, in terms of driving it, there's the difficulty of moving it, but what's it like to drive and to sit in? And I'm telling you now, it is superb. Very comfortable and very quiet. What makes this so quiet is the double skinned uh, build of the doors and the side panels, but also the double glazed windows on the front. Windscreen and side windows and your front windows do help to make it a much more quiet. Um, and it just helps to deaden that sound from the road and the surroundings. So in 
terms of the rear end of the car while we're here, boot space is plentiful. All those wondering how you open the boot, it's hidden in there. And as you can see, my boot is full of cloths, but that is cavernous. Here's my arm. Yeah, I'm not even, so my whole arm, very short I must admit, <laughs> isn't touching the end of the boot. So yeah, cavernous. I will put a photo on here now over the screen showing you the actual boot inside as mine is full. The other 407 other than the Freelease HDR you will have a full size spare wheel in the wheel well but on this Freelease HDI it has the twin tips so this has got an aftermarket exhaust system the front factory this will have a big fat box underneath which has two exits of the exhaust and what they've done in here is they've cut the boot pan out to fit the exhaust in and raised it up so you can only have a space saver on this <laughs> Literally this only trim level and model only of the range. So as you can see from this angle here, it's in a very appealing design. And I think the coupe itself is not too well proportioned, but is a relatively good looker. And like I said, with the length and the size and the stature this car has, it really does stand out on the road. I just want to mention the roof lining, how the pillars come up from the rear window. This rear window is excellent for self-cleaning, so without the wiper you might be thinking, oh, what's rear visi visibility like? It's excellent because the aerodynamic design means it pushes the water off of the window really nicely, so it's always really clear. So only the 3 litre HDI has the twin exhaust setup from standard. This is a slightly larger tip from the OEM, but they have the twin tip bumper. All of the other variants have the single side left hand exhaust with the twin tips. But optional extra on this car from factory, which I've actually had fitted but was not extra extra, is the rear spoiler. It's not a standard fit. You'll be very hard to find. It'll be very hard to find one of these with the rear wing on it. They're all normally without, so enjoy how that looks. Oh. oh, this car is so comfortable. It is excellent. So this seat is in the lowest setting it goes. As you can see, there's ample headroom. I would say probably someone that's six foot, no problems. Um, I sit with my legs quite stretched out, no problems. There's also plenty of room behind me here, still for the seat to go back if you were a taller driver. So I wouldn't say there'd be any issues for any drivers of any sort of height. If you're quite short, um, you can move it forwards without a problem. Now, the seats are super comfy, comfy. they're very bolstered here, very, very supportive. Um, you have not only the adjustment of the base rake, you've got the adjustment of the rear of the seat and obviously the seat moving forwards and backwards. Um, the heated option is optional on some, but is there. And what's really smart about the system is the seat has the memory option here on the door for two drivers but with the memory option you also get the mirrors included so when you're changing the seating position the mirrors will also mirror the seating position of the driver that set them and on top of that as well on certain models gt and other spec you also get the indexing mirrors which is where you go into reverse and it will drop either mirror to the floor depending on which one you select which is a great little feature um, but as we said over the door cards you know these are big heavy you know big heavy thick doors lots of leather um, metal behind them is quite big as well, there's a lot of metal parts to this door um, and that just leads to it being very heavy. Also, maybe another issue depending on how you address it, uh, the door doesn't have the greatest angle of opening and the bigger problem is, is look how far open you have to be. If I was to be honest with you right now, I'd say what would be the smallest like gal? Here? Now, if you think a parking space is already probably the size of the car. This long door, again, is the other downfall to it not only being heavy, is, you know. Joey, I've got to like do gymnastics to get my leg. You know, it's not a desirable look. Um, if I, I literally try it now, it's hard to move there, but, you know, you're, um, you know, you can't, it hits through, you know. I know that in all situations in the real world, that isn't always going to be the parking space, but I'm just trying to highlight to be honest that the doors are massive and heavy and it is a bit of a problem when it comes to parking. So the electric seats are great, 
they've got a self scroll forwards, self scroll back, and they also will basically align themselves back in the position when you close them back up. So it's ready for people to climb in. Now, in terms of rear space, the rear space is excellent. Now, there's plenty of height again on the ceiling. There's also plenty of leg room. Now, the leg room is obviously dependent on the driver in front of you, but me, with how I drive, we can take four people in this car comfortably. Leg room is a bit tight here, but it's not too bad. In the rear, you've got an armrest, you've got an electric plug for charging your phone, you've got your own air vents in the rear as well. Um, and we also have uh, cup holders here in the rear as well. So you get quite a little bit of sort of um, little spec in the rear. So you've got the ski hatch, goes on through to the boot. And we've got the hooks up here as well, which are quite cool. Look, they're uh, little fold out hooks for your clothes. Um, and the rear position in here is, as you can see as you come round, um, is great. It's, it's decent. I would say you would really get someone in here probably of six foot height, um, and it would work absolutely fine. Rear parking sensors, front parking sensors, self leveling by Xenon headlights, automatic cornering lights, electrically heated folding wing mirrors that are also electrically adjustable on the mirror pane, as well as, in some versions, memory set with the seats. Indexing mirror which drops when selected in reverse for you to be able to see where the curb is. Double glazed windows and memory seats. Full leather interior, rear armrest and ski hatch into the boot. Extended leather pack, doors, inside trims and dashboard. Two styles of sat-nav system, the basic system here with the more basic radio. And the enhanced radio here with additional options as well as JBL sound system, which this car again doesn't have. That is noted by the JBL letters on the door cards. Automatic dampening for the three litre models only, petrol and diesel, indicated here by the spring button for sport and comfort mode. Cruise control, speed limiter, air conditioning, auto wipers and auto lights, auto dimming mirror, velvet lined door bins, door cards and cubby holes. Just to add in with the AC, these have a six way adjustable dual climate control system with automatic temperature regulation. So guys, we're gonna talk about engines and gearboxes. So to settle the score and make it very simple, it is as simple as this. If you have any four cylinder, they are a manual. The only change to that is the three litre petrol ES9 V6 is also available in manual and automatic. Um, the rest of the 2.7s and three litre diesels are automatic only and they use an AM6 automatic box, which the AM6, the AM6 runs in semi-automatic where you can have your own electronic adjustment gears or you can have it as a sole automatic where it does its own thing with a sport button to really make it more precise. So basically it's pretty simple. If you want the automatic cruiser, go for the bigger engines. But if you want that enjoyment of changing the gears yourself, obviously the three litre petrol or the rest of the smaller engines. So I am talking from personal experience. I've owned a 136, I've owned a 163. You're thinking what does this mean? I'll explain. I've also owned a 3 litre ES9 petrol and this 3 litre HDI V6. So we'll start from the engines and work our way up. Now, in terms of engines, if you get a four cylinder, you can only get them spec'd as a Sport or an SE trim, 
Now, some of the SC trims will have additional features to it, which do bring it up to a GT level, but that's just down to options from when the car was new. And the GT is only on the six cylinder models. Apart from this 3 litre HDI, which is a little bit confusing, we're going to sit into too much detail, but this 3 litre HDI is actually a sport auto with option spec. So this one will not be as high spec as a GT, but will pretty much be in between an SE and a GT. It's a long story that one, but at the end I'll explain why this 3 litre HDI comes out as a sport model. So with these engines, the 163 um, supersedes the 136, and they ran in the pre-facelift, and the 163 is in the facelift, but very rare. Um, they're both super reliable, great six-speed manual, very cheap to run, uh, decent on tax, and I can tell you now the shelf life is around 300,000 miles, and they are superb engines. A little bit underpowered, I must admit, for this car, but a very reliable choice for you there. In terms of petrols, there are only two. There is a 2.2 naturally aspirated petrol that comes in a six-speed manual um, and that is pretty much raspy and bang on for what you need for this car but if you really want the extra ponies and the additional noise and benefits of the 3 litre v6 then the 3 litre v6 es9 is the one to go for now with the 2.2 and the 3 litre es9 there's an obvious difference in fuel economy there's an obvious difference in insurance prices um, but i would in all honesty say it's just worth the benefits of the 3 litre but of course look at the 2.2 look at the 3 litre and work out what is better for you um, in terms of fuel my 3 litre petrol um, I could get probably 450 miles on the tank which is about 100 pounds not really I do sort of average in late 20s early 30s at a push and I think the 2.2 does a little bit better sort of pushing into mid 35s but they're both obviously lacking big car um, petrol engine it's just one of those things so the 2.7 is the most common engine on the entire range uh, that one's with the 6 AM6 automatic um, the only downside to the 2.7 is it does come with the higher tax bracket of around at the moment don't quote me but around 700 pounds a year of tax um, and the difference between that and the 3 litre I'll explain as simply as this the 3 litre is the facelift model only um, the tax is around half um, but it's, it's extremely rare, so it's only about 45 litres in the UK. And the main difference is as simple as this. The MPG is about 5 to 10 more with the 3 litre HDI, and it's also a lot more powerful and efficient while there as well. So you go from your 201 horsepower straight up to your 240 on a standard map. Um, and the 3 litre itself is just the better engine. It's going to be, it's newer, it's just how it is. Um, but that is quite simply the entirety of the engine range for the 407 Coupe. Any questions you have about them in more detail, comment below, give me a message, and I'm happy to help. All I can say is basically all the engines are really decent, but if I had to choose two, it would be the 3 litre V6 petrol or the 3 litre V6 HDI, because the V6s are what really suit this car. So this is the DT20 facelifted version of the DT17, which was a 2.7 HDI by turbo, and this is the 3 litre by turbo V6. Now, the reason why this only model came such in, the, in such a late stage as a sport spec was because when Peugeot made this, because they made so many changes, I'll just give you a few examples of moving the battery to the back, um, adding a strong, uh, stronger rear anti-roll bar, adding a twin exit exhaust, having to cut the boot out and make all that fit in there as well. They brought the price up to over 30 grand when it was new, which is quite a problem. So the reason why this was dropped to a sports spec, because this wasn't selling, because the 3 litre was 30 grand back in the day, and no one wanted to pay that for a Peugeot, they decided to bring it out as a sports spec, so you got the best engine and all the bits, all the bits with it, but then you had to spec all the optional, all the optional extras like JBL, um, um, and we're missing front parking sensors. So that's the three I'm missing on this sport model as an example from the GT. I've got everything the GT's got, but I'm missing front parking sensors. The I've got the self-leveling lights, but I haven't got the, the cornering lights. Um, and I'm also missing the JBL, which isn't, do you know what? I've had both had the JBL on the old car. Um, and I said they both sound amazing, but the JBL obviously is gonna have the edge and will sound better overall. So this car has a few little quirks, one of them being, the electric pop out for the fuel cap. Now that is very Jaguar German. It's here on this fancy button. It pops it out for you. And that is only, as far as I'm aware, on the coupe only. Love it. 
to market RC said steering wheel that I've installed so ignore that that wouldn't look like that in a normal one but as we get in we're greeted by these glorious dials and this is the facelift so the pre facelift has this uh, pan panel this trim all the trim around the vents over here over there in a sort of matte silver this is the facelift so it has a black gloss black sparkly surround to it and also the radio itself is a little bit fresher a little bit newer obviously here we have the auto box and the cup holder that's a little bit lethargic but working and there's plenty of room so i'm going to do a little quick interior tour now so obviously here's your sat nav unit all of your infotainment system comes through that it also works on the central display which is here also in terms of cubby holes we've got one down there which carries quite a lot of stuff it's a great one little pull out cubby hole you have the um cigarette lighter port to charge your phones a little sort of ashtray storage zone there you have a two-way adjustable armrest so you have a lower setting and higher setting then this also opens up with storage inside there as well we also have a weighted look at that glove box a lot of cars cheap Peugeots just drops like anything but this is a weighted slowed drop that is leather life's quality leather the same with the dash as well and that reveals the storage space there and that is all felt lined which is great so the door bins are fairly uh they're fairly deep but they're quite thin so you can fit a very large bottle in there with a very big squeeze but normal size bottles sit in there perfectly and in terms of interior space it's a very nice place to be lots of nice brushed steel leather it is a really nice experience so let's jump in the car and go for a drive also in terms of carrying four people the rear seats are also isofix so there is the ability to carry isofix seats in there and i would say with the height room of the roof you could definitely carry two small children in the back of there with relative ease as long as you can deal with the fairly slow moving chair um, it could definitely be a ideal car for a small family seven coupe like to drive now i'm going to tell you honestly how it is so it's madly comfortable it's Comfortable is the understatement, basically. It's super comfortable in here. Now, my car's on the lower end spring, so it's a little bit more bouncy. You might, you might get that coming from the video, but this is generally a very comfortable place to be. Also, you can probably hear, there isn't too much road noise. You will hear the occasional rattle, and that is my arch line is rattling because my car's levered. Shouldn't have done it. It's one of those things. But it is a great driver. Um, the seating position is great. Lots of adjustment. Lots of adjustment on the steering wheel. You've got extension of the steering wheel. You've got height of the steering wheel. And the multi-level armrest, everything is just great. You cruise along, arm on the armrest, arm on the door, and it is just a really nice place to be, super comfortable. In terms of performance of the coupe, you're going to find the smaller engines are going to struggle a little bit, whereas your V6 power plants aren't. And the peach of the range, of course, is going to be the 3 litre HDI twin turbo, which is absolutely relentless in its power. But regardless of what engine you get, you're going to have a quiet and calm driving experience with the cruise control on on the motorway it is an absolute pleasure to be in so guys that is the end of this video thank you for joining me on this whistle stop quick tour review of the 407 coupe i hope it was helpful i probably have missed things because there's a lot of things in this range and a lot of things going on with these vehicles specs etc etc so how many missed you think i do apologize but do give me a comment below or send me a message and i'll assist with you in finding a 47 coupe for your needs